the locals call this place La Colina, translating to the bull, and for good reason. This place is very unforgiving. There's not a lot of runoff area over most of the circuit, which means that there's very little room for error and a variety of corner types that are going to test these drivers' road racing abilities over the course of the day. The Gambits have been on a tear. The last few races, John Gambit got his first top five. Back at Olton Park, Jim Gambit already has two top threes to his name, and he got, grabs the pole here for race number two at Circuito Internacional de Malaga. Jake Baskinger already looking on the outside in the number 10 uh, Napa machine through turn number four now. Still side by side, and the 10 is going to get the spot going up the hill, nearly getting some air time at the top of the hill there. Jack Lagacy started on outside pole, but got swept around by multiple drivers after he really failed to go on that start. Baskinger uses all of the track limits there to try and keep ahead of the 44, but he, the 44 gets to the inside. Gambit trying to run around the outside through turn number six as the 10 tries to protect down low. Blake Camphausen currently in fourth. This, If he can keep this up, this will be by far his best effort of the year as the 10 slides wide, leaving the door open for the 44 into turn number seven. Seven, still side by side as the 10 gets sideways through the corner. He will keep the lead three wide behind him for second with the five and the 441 going for that spot. Camphausen trying to make his way into the podium, but Baskinger still holds the lead coming up the hill towards Daytona for the first time. What a first lap it's been already. Henry Williams round the outside of the number 45 through Daytona. Taylor Price trying to hold off a charge and Caitlin Sang into turn 13. Grayson Acovito checks up. Taylor Price ended up making it three wide there, I think unintentionally. And Grayson Acovito is going to stall that car out on the apron of turn number 13. Shame for him. Terrible start to the race. He will end up needing a tow back to the pits. Into Wine Valley, the final hairpin on the circuit for the first time. Baskinger runs wide, so does Jim Gambit, and we're three wide off the final corner already. Jake Baskinger in the number 10 sweeps down a lane. He gets the best exit, and he will lead the opening lap of the race. Jim Gambit maintains second at the line. Jack Lagacy powering his way back to the front. He got by Blake Camphausen as the 10 nearly runs off the circuit, and the 44 back to the race lead. A near collision as Anderson, Piet, and Kras to get locked together there, but they keep her going straight. Great job by them. Uh, that's been a trouble spot, turn number six, back in race number one. I wouldn't be surprised to see it become a trouble spot again as Torres nearly makes it four wide through turn number seven. It's too early for that stuff, guys. Come on. Demir Bejinov in the 13 with a surprisingly poor road course qualifying effort. Normally one of those guys you'd see on pole or near the front, but 38th spot, very uncharacteristic of the Kazakh racer. He'll be looking to try and get into the top 20 before this race is over. Top four drivers beginning to break away from the rest of the field, and that's not really a surprise to see why. They're three wide across the stripe. Hamill, Camphausen, and Curtis. Curtis has the most to lose. Wouldn't be surprised to see him be the first to back out. Yes, he does. Coming into turn one and two, he will get the spot over Camphausen potentially anyways. Kyle Collins in the 48 has come close to race victories. He'll be one to watch out for in this one as well, it appears. As Zayden Davidson, just behind in the eighth spot, started in the top four, I believe, but uh, has fallen just a little bit in the, uh, the special pink breast cancer awareness car. Battle still on for that fourth spot. Whoa, Camphausen nearly into the 34, and that's going to leave the door open for DJ Curtis. Remember what I was saying about him maybe taking it easy these first few laps to stay out of trouble? Well, it looks like I was just kidding, because uh, Derek Hamill, Kyle Collins, and, and Zane Davidson get together. Hamill's up over the wall in the number 34 car, and he's going to feel that one in the morning for sure. Derek Hamill upside down on the wrong side of the barrier that is that will most certainly take him out of the race it'll likely take collins out of the race as well duncan started this race 40th and on probation after his actions from 
Fulton Park, currently sitting behind Skyla Johnson, racing for 38th. Oh, no. No. Duncan, why? Skyla Johnson out of the race from that contact. Duncan is going to need to tow back. He's stuck in the fence. But that's going to come under the watchful eye of the Hark officials for sure. Especially because there's a camera on Duncan's car that's going to tell the story. Let's take another look here from Duncan's roof cam. This is going to be the incriminating evidence if it isn't indeed Duncan's fault. Johnson got the tiniest bit loose, but Duncan... Duncan got back in the gas after making contact there. That, that does not look good for William Duncan, who is hoping to make this season as a recovery after a horrid 2016 campaign. We're going to ha just have to wait and see what the officials decide. After getting a tow back to the pits, Grayson Acevedo now finds himself a lap down in the middle of the same traffic that he formerly was in. Amazingly enough, Annie Thomas is slow on the racetrack. She started this lap 13th, but has fallen. She might have a tire going down or something. Grayson Acevedo contact with Will Hoyt, then with Thomas, then with Krasta. And Sidney Krasta is finally just going to take care of the unstable Acevedo by turning him as they go down the hill kind of justifiably considering how erratically the 45 was driving the 8hw had to make a hell of a save there with everyone stacking up three wide or so heading into turns 14 and 15 zayden davidson down pit road annie thomas uh down pit road not surprisingly as well what a lap it's been i thought this was racing not ping pong Back up to the race lead battle, and it's the Gambits side by side coming to the start finish line here. Who's going to lead the lap? I think that was John Gambit in the five machine trying to make a pass on his brother Jim. Jake Baskinger makes it three wide through turns one and two. Jim trying to run the outside to get back by, but he runs into the gravel trap, as does Jack Legacy. That will hand the lead to his brother, John Gamut in the five machine. The Napa car of Jake Baskinger closely behind in second place. John Gambit didn't leave Jake a whole lot of room on the bottom of the track there, but Jake got his nose in and is still on the outside of the number five car. Wow, what a dive into the corner. Jake Baskinger just had... They're going to be side by side through the treacherous turn seven and eight complex once again. John Gamut has to really get on the brakes a little bit there to, in order to make the corner. And Jake Baskinger just inches away from the number five, retakes uh, the lead for himself. Jack Lagacy in the 18 car trying to get by, but is not able to do so. Stuck on the outside through the sweeping turn 11. And the Gambit's team up to bump draft up towards Daytona. Krasta with a problem under the hood of the number 21 car. Not her first rodeo so far this year with mechanical troubles at road courses. Also fell out of the race uh, at uh, Brasstown Ball. Might be a similar issue here. Uh, procrastination. Uh, the Krasta team has really got to figure that out as we've got a crash down in turn number six. Gustavus Cortez has had a very impressive start to the day, currently running inside the top 10, trying to get by Ike Durbin, dives it in there, but gets it into the side of Durbin and spins the car into the wall. That smoke billing, billowing out of the number 62 does not look good. That car likely going out of the race is Nick Pericles with a close call there. Luca Obrovac had nowhere to go when the 62 speared up the racetrack. And he also got a piece of that unclear whether or not Obrovac will be able to continue as well. Baskinger and Lagacy have pulled away from the teammates since they got by them. But Lagacy is not content running in second. Goes to the inside of Baskinger through Wine Valley and now trying to make a charge up the outside into turn number one. This is the stuff that has gotten Legacy into trouble before, particularly at Olton Park when racing with Eugene DeMax. We're not even a quarter of the way through this thing. There's no reason to be going for the win, but Legacy does it nonetheless. It's certainly putting on a show for these Spanish fans. 
Nick Pericles and Michael Harvey run side by side into three. Anderson throws his nose in at the last possible second to make it three wide. Pericles with not a lot of room to work with. Bounces off the 72. Denzel Williams in one of the stupidest moves that I've seen today. Takes out Caitlin Sang by trying to make four wide work through not even a quarter of the way through the race through a gap that really didn't exist in the first place. Colin McGovern smashes into the back of the 07 completely. Arca breaks it really into the 07 he had lots of time to figure that stuff out uh, but uh, the 07 with significant rear end damage that's really going to affect the performance of her car today I imagine through all of the chaos I think it's important to shout out the drivers that have been keeping their noses fairly clean but putting on one hell of a show nonetheless John King and Spencer Fullerton lead this hungry group of drivers composed of a mix of some of the more experienced drivers like uh, Prudence Littlejohn and Spencer Fullerton as well as top rookies like Matthew Engelram and uh, John King. Zayden Davidson stay goes from bad to worse. He gets into the back of the 42 of Colin McGovern returning the favor really after what McGovern did to Caitlin Sang. Both of these drivers are going to go out of the race as a result. Lagacy's been a tough man to pass. Jim Gambit has gotten to his rear bumper but Lagacy so far has been defending Every charge that the 44 can throw at him is Antivia Kingray has spun back in turn number 15. Kingray has been having a very cruddy season in the 03 car, was running 7th, racing hard with James Shelley in the 12, makes a little contact with the 12 there and spins out through turns 14 and 15. I'd say that was a racing deal, they were just racing really hard. For that spot, William Duncan goes by in the 83 car. He is three laps down, but still out on track. No verdict yet from the Hark officials. Seventh place continues to be one of the most hotly contested positions on the racetrack right now. We got Andreas Allen in the 39, holding a ton of road course experience. His only win came at a road course back at, in the 2014 season at South Carolina. Casey Lester in the 013 has a second place to his name and does not give Andreas or James a whole lot of room to work with through turns three and four, taking up most of the bottom and pushing up to the middle line as well. But James Shelley holding his own as well in the 12 machine, but has to give way to Casey Lester and Andreas Allen for now. Demir Bejianov through the chaos, has managed to get his way into the top 20. Michael Harvey going for that spot, gets into the side of the 13, spins himself around, no harm, no foul, next to no damage for the 72 car, just a few spots and probably some pride lost as a result. Lucas Knight has fallen out of the top 10, just doesn't seem to have the pace of his fellow competitors. Might have used up his tires too early. AJ Green goes by in the 55, has to check up to make the corner, and the 19 gets it all wrong and takes the 55 with him into the gravel trap. The 55 got the worst of it as far as damage, but John King gets the worst of it from a time perspective. Turn six claims yet another victim as Aiden Shepard gets into the side of the 666 of Jokey Lethen and spins it up to the outside, which would be all fine and dandy if AJ Green wasn't trying to get by. William Duncan had nowhere to go, Sma slams into the back of the 14 machine, and the 55's front end completely sheared away as he billows smoke down towards turn number seven. Shepard might be able to continue, surprisingly, despite that huge hook hit that uh, the 14 just took. AJ Green on the meanwhile will go from a potential top 10 to wrecking out in just six corners. Robert Piet gets into the back of the 14 and the 17 spins in just for good measure. Suppose that was a, uh, a, a good heads up move from the 17. A, uh, a nice surprise after what he did earlier on. At long last, Jack Lagacy forced into a mistake by Jim Gambit who had been hounding him for the last 10 minutes or so goes way up the track in Wine Valley and Gambit will get the positions through turns one and two.
Caitlin Sang continues to ride around in 30th place. I think something's wrong. She's completely missed the apex to turn one, trying to get out of the way, but Luko Brovac gets into the back of the 07. Caitlin Sang takes several hard hits there. Robert Piet had just fixed some of the front end damage. He got last lap around, and now he's out of the race as well. Tristan Wilhoit has been forcing the issue on Henry Williams. Turn six not is not the place to do it, man. And Henry Williams and Wilhoit both into the wall. Williams out of the race for sure. Wilhoit's probably out as well. Lot of damage to really the entire frame on that 16 machine. It'd be a miracle if he could get that thing back out. Tip of the hat to Prudence Littlejohn, up into 10th spot with a great overtake on Spencer Fullerton. Lucas Knight still hanging on in there in around 11th spot, racing with Matthew Engelram as we're coming up on the pit cycle now. Legacy got the spot back from Jim Gamut, who has since fallen to fourth behind Baskinger and his brother, Jake Baskinger is not dilly-dallying, though. He's going after the 18 through turn number 8 and into 9, but an amazing defending maneuver by Jack Lagacy will ensure that he keeps the lead at least for the next couple of corners or so. For the better part of three and a half minutes now, Luko Brovac has been trying to keep his car out of the way, but trying to get back down to his pit box. J Justin Carter gets into the back of him. Obrovac swerved at the last second there, but just couldn't get it out of the way in time. It's, I think this is going to be called the, the Great Smoke Down of 2017. Luka Obrovac continues to push that car to its limits, to its remaining limits. Completely annihilated number 78 car making its way through the last few corners towards what will be its checkered flag. Jokey Lethanen in the back of him. Lethanen with damage to the front end that will take him out of the race. The 85 is going to need to pit as well. He's taking civilian casualties left and right. But the 78 of Luka Obrovac will make it to his pit box. He's only got one corner to go. He's done it, ladies and gentlemen. He's done it. Jake Baskinger in line with the 18. He's got a run up on him. As we head into turn number six, makes a move to the inside. This could end in tears. No, it doesn't, though. They keep it side by side, exiting the corner, but they gave each other lots of room for that position. Great heads up move by the 18. Seems like these guys are more stable. Who would have thunk the, the uh, fastest four drivers were also uh, the drivers that had the track most figured out? Shocker there. Am I right? Uh, but Jake Baskinger by Jack Lagacy in the 18 and 2. The race lead for uh, probably the second or third time today. Lagacy still all over him. I still think any of these four could probably win this thing. But when Baskinger and Lagacy get out in front of the Gambits, they're a force to be reckoned with. The roles are reversed. One lap later, it's Lagacy back to the front in front of Baskinger immediately clears Baskinger in fact great pass Lagacy's been putting on a master class in how to both overtake and defend at a road course so far today as he has both at Watkins Glen and Olden Park before his wrecks he has a tendency to drive in a bit over his head but it's still surprising that that 18 car doesn't have sponsorship Speaking of driving it in over your head, Baskinger into the side of the 18 there, shoves him all the way up the track, but Lagacy's going to hold on to that spot nonetheless. Just 11 laps remaining, Lagacy onto the rumble strips, that's going to allow Baskinger to got by, get by, I say just 11 laps, that's nearly 50 miles still to go, we've, we've still got a pit stop. To do as well the gamuts continue to lose time by racing amongst each other as you can see they're still side by side a several seconds back of these top two now Bassinger gets the lead from the 18 but he's got to be careful otherwise jack might be able to get him back through turn six where he's been so strong the 18 gives a little bit of a bump to the 10 10 shoots up the track and easily the 18 goes right on back by the number 10 car Pit 
We're coming up on pit stops, and that could really make or break the race for either of these top two drivers. Might even get one of the gambits back into the race. DJ Curtis and Blake Kamphausen have been running a quiet fifth and sixth place, keeping out of trouble, just minding their P's and Q's ever since the beginning of the race. They're now actually coming up on the gambits for third and fourth place, running comparable lap times to the leaders, which actually says a lot about the leaders, considering the leaders are battling and these guys aren't. But uh, nonetheless, we could see a battle for third and fourth place heat up especially after the pit cycle. The leaders catching Aiden Shepard, first lap car they've encountered in the last little while or so, basking her way off the road in the number 10 into the gravel trap. Uncharacteristic error by Baskinger there as he slides it out wide. Looks like the top two are coming down pit road this time. That's actually going to hand the lead to Prudence Littlejohn of all people. Prudence Littlejohn, led a lap. James Shelley, the only other driver to stretch it to 17 laps on that first tank of gas. Jack Legacy out first in the number 18, but the 10 has reeled in him since the pit cycle. Their pit stops nearly identical in length. The Gambits both lost time on these top two, and Baskinger round the outside once again of Legacy, it's going to be a head-to-head -head duel, it looks like, unless something goes terribly, terribly wrong. Well, to be fair, like it did in race number one between these top two. Here comes Legacy again with a move through turn six. He's so good on this part of the racetrack, easily sweeps by the 10 and back to the lead. Now running sixth and seventh are Andreas Allen and Prudence Littlejohn, who have put on a really good show over the course of this race on their challenges to get inside the top first inside the top 10 and now both going for a run inside the top five especially if they can catch up to the gambits and dj curtis just ahead lucas knight new set of tires new attitude going after spencer fullerton for 12th place into turn number six takes a look down low on the 73 gets into the side of him there and he's played himself with a puff of smoke, he is out of the race. Baskinger with a run on the 18, up through 11, towards Daytona. Haven't seen them side by side through this section of the course before, at least not these two leaders. Baskinger slides up the racetrack in the 18. He's really pushing that 10 car to its limits as Legacy is forced all the way to the top side of the racetrack. Who's going to have the better run through turn 13? Legacy uses the 10 up through the corner to get back to the race lead. A little bit of bumping and rubbing between these two, but uh, they keep it straight going in a straight line. This is going to be one hell of a last eight laps if these guys can keep this up. Annie Thomas pit very early on in the race, I think due to being involved in some sort of incident, had just finished her second stop now and has now had an ignition failure under the hood of the number 93. Saw that car lurch to the right side of the racetrack as Thomas knew what was going on. And Thomas brings that car to a stop between turns 5 and 6. Really sucks. She was on a recovery run up to 19th at that point. Legacy again onto the rumble strips out of turn number two. Baskinger again takes a look to the outside of the number 18. 18 tries to shut the door this time, but the 10 is already there. And Baskinger around the outside through turn number three and into turn four. Legacy again tries to get in front of the 10, but the 10 with an amazing runoff. Eight, the 18 puts everything into getting into the corner through turns three and four, and that allows Baskinger to just soar ahead once they get out of the corner. Bask that was Baskinger's section of the racetrack. Now it's Legacy's section of the racetrack. So strong through turns five and six. Gets right back by the ten like nothing ever happened in the first place. This time around, Baskinger caught the 18, but he did not make a move through Daytona. Instead, staying right in the 18's toe. He's seeing if he can make a pass through here. Kind of preparation probably for the last couple of laps where it's going to matter the most. 10 up the outside. That'll become the inside through turn 15. All the way out to the edge of the racetrack there. A little bit of contact. And the 10 goes by the 18. Wow, what a pass that was. 
That was that was edgy, literally. Uh, and Baskinger will lead the lap for once. Tends to be Legacy across the stripe first. Baskinger just found a new way to get by the 18 should the chance arise in that final lap. Without someone to follow, though, Baskinger got onto the rumble strips through turn one and two. So did Legacy, but... But Baskinger got held up more, lost a little bit more speed. And Legacy takes to the inside to try and get by Baskinger. Interesting that he didn't try and take Baskinger's line away on the top side. But Baskinger will hold on as a result. Third through eighth, meanwhile, that's anyone's guess. Jim Gambit currently leads this group of six. DJ Curtis taking a peek down low on the 44. Contact made between the two of them. Great save by the 44. He gets into the grass, but not into the fence like so many have earlier on in the race. John Gambit takes a look on the 33 for third as Curtis moves into that position behind them. Andreas Allen and Nick Pericles also made contact through turn six, but they both kept it going as well. He's, those two losing time on these three with Prudence Littlejohn just probably trying to stay out of it. Less than five laps to go, and again, without that benchmark, Jake Baskinger just can't quite pull away on the 18, even though this is where I'd consider Baskinger to be overall faster on average. The 18, all over the 10 as a result, and they're coming up on the 14 of Aiden Shepard. They, uh, they came up on him right before they entered pit road. Might have been a contributing factor to why they came in when they did. They just didn't want to have to deal with the 14. This time they're going to have to, though. And Baskinger, under intense pressure from the 18, makes a mistake into turn number five. And Legacy's through even more than usual. Several car lengths now separate the top two as Legacy closes in on that damaged number 14 machine. The Napa car might be able to close in if Legacy does have trouble getting by the 14. This isn't the best section of the course to be catching a lap car. It's uh, kind of tricky to make a pass none, uh, regardless of whether you're a lap down or not. And Legacy's dream would be to get by the 14 now and then have the 10 have problems leading to some so sort of separation. But Legacy himself is having a lot of trouble with the 14. Shepard not exactly being the nicest of back markers. He hasn't been giving these guys a whole lot of room. And now Legacy finally gets by. Baskinger has a run on the 18. Gets by the 14 in one fell swoop, but can't challenge Legacy as things stand. Matthew Engelram had just gotten into the top 15 after getting by Sebastian Torres when Torres got into the back of the 47. Through turn six, Torres drives off like nothing happened. And that's it for the 47, though. He is done out of the race with just around four laps remaining. That's completely uncharacteristic of Sebastian Torres, especially considering what happened to Torres last year under the wrath of William Duncan. Once DJ Curtis got into third, he pulled away from the Gambit brothers. Prudence Littlejohn has charged her way through that six-car group up to fourth place. Might lose the spot to Gambit. Those three seem pretty equal. Behind them, Nick Pericles and Andreas Allen still got a shot at a top five as well. If these guys keep racing like this. Behind them, James Shelley, Casey Lester, Blake Camphausen still hanging on in there with Ike Durbin several seconds behind. Durbin lost a lot of time under his pit stop. Four laps remaining this time. Legacy led at the stripe. Legacy onto the rumble strips. And Jake Baskinger again uses the outside. He might be able to clear the 18 heading into turn number three. Can't quite do it though. The 18 forces him up the track. 18 going at it hard nearly into, into the side of the 10. Through the corner a little bit sideways. Half sideways was the number 18 of Jack Legacy. Baskinger back into the lead. Got a couple of car lengths over the 18, but Jack Legacy's been so, so strong in this section of the course. Legacy's pushing very, very hard, though. He's got to be careful that what happened at Olton doesn't happen here as well. Baskinger runs very wide in Daytona, and that will allow the 18 to be better set up for turn number 13. 
Baskinger comes in at a very shallow angle, loses a lot of speed as, as a result. Legacy had to check up a little bit to avoid getting into the 10, but he's still got a run on him coming down the hill. Takes a look to the inside entering turn 14. That'll become the outside contact made between the two of them. 18 nearly off the road, and Baskinger keeps the spot. But Legacy might have a run on the inside since the 10 ran wide in Wine Valley once again. Just three laps to go this time. Legacy might try and swap them up in turns one and two. Baskinger hangs in for now. They, I think the most amazing bit of these two racing is that they're actually pulling away from third place as we speak. Baskinger off the road. That allows Legacy to get back by as Baskinger doesn't head to the high side this time to protect. Legacy now has a one up on Jake Baskinger should they end up like that on the final lap. Jake Baskinger still holding strong with the 18. Can he improve his position in what's typically been Legacy's section of the racetrack into turn number six? No, Legacy's too strong. He'll hold on. The Gambit brothers still running side by side for fourth with Prudence Littlejohn and Andreas Allen right there in the wings. Prudence Littlejohn takes a look. Andreas Allen, though, takes a look on the 31 before the 31 can try and get underneath the five of John Gambit. The five might actually get by his back by his brother as the Gambits form a bit of a roadblock on the rest of the field. I think we've got a little bit of a wreck further back. The drivers at the rear of the top 10 had just caught an Aiden Shepard to put him a lap down. Heracles went to the outside to try and get the job done. Lester and Shelley both saw a chance to improve their position. Pericles and Shelley both into the wall as a result. Just one of those racing deals. Uh, drivers pushing hard in the last couple of laps to try and gain some positions. Ironically enough, less than a straightaway later, Aiden Shepard would blow up. Finally pulls it off. To the inside of the road between turns seven and eight It'd be better if you did that before everyone wrecked around you you dummy uh, Aiden Shepard not gonna be a popular one in the paddock after this one Legacy's out of line on the ending part of the S's for the second to last time Jake Baskinger takes a look to the inside can't make anything of it for now as Legacy moves down half a lane to try and cover the 10 off. Baskinger makes a move regardless. Heading into Daytona, forces the 18 up the track. They both are off the racing line through there. The 18 is going to have a better run off of the corner. He needs to get back over to the left to cover his tracks for this tri triple apex turn 13. Isn't able to do so. Ends up in the grass. And as a result, here comes Jake Baskinger with a run down the hill uh, towards the white flag. If Bassinger can keep his nose in there, he might have a shot at making the pass through turn 15. Legacy onto the grass, but he keeps his nose there. Heading into Wine Valley, Bassinger trying to make a run up the outside. Both drivers way off the racing line, but it doesn't matter because they're miles in front of the rest of the field and are actually gaining time on them as we speak. White flag is out just a half a car length between these top two drivers and Bassinger with a unique situation here. He's up the inside of the 18, heading through turns one and two. We haven't seen this, despite the fact that these guys have been battling on and off for the last dozen or so laps. Legacy's able to hold the 10 off through turns one and two. This is Bassinger's section of the track, or at least it has tended to be. So if Bassinger's going to get by Legacy, it'd be a pretty good time to do it now. Legacy needs a perfect lap in order to hold off Bassinger. Jake Baskinger was able to close in on Jack Legacy through turns five and six. Close the gap to half a car length, but that's where it stayed. Legacy with a perfect set of S's, dives it into Daytona as hard as he can to protect from a challenge from Jake Baskinger, who couldn't quite get the run up the hill like he has been the last few laps. Baskinger ends up on the inside of the 18. Can the 18 shut the door through turn 13? Yes, he can. Despite using some of the grass, he will stay in front of the number 10. Just three corners to go for Legacy to hold on for his first ever victory. It'll be his first ever top 15, let alone victory, if he can hold on to it. Jake Baskinger going for his second of the year. Legacy tries to shut the door into the final corner, but ends up leaving the door open for Baskinger. 
through the final corner. He's got to run on the inside. Drag race down to the line. It's been a dozen or so laps in the making. Who's going to win it? I think it was Legacy. No! It was Baskinger. Baskinger beat him. Baskinger got him by one one thousandth of a second in the closest finish Hark has ever had and in one of the best battles that Hark has ever had over the past dozen or so laps. What a race. And so Jake Baskinger with a perfectly timed last lap pass by the slimmest of margins will be heading to victory lane here at race two at Circuito Internacional de Malaga. Jack Lagacy, 15 laps led, easily his best run of his career with in second place. Proved himself out on track as both a good defensive and offensive driver, but it's still going to feel like a punch in the stomach. DJ Curtis, third place, seven and a half seconds back of the leaders. Once he got himself there, he pulled away from his fellow competitors in those final few laps. Andreas Allen with a hard charge in the last couple of laps to get himself up to fourth position. John Gambit, solid run all day, finishes fifth, beating out Prudence Littlejohn, who finished sixth by just one one hundredth of a second. Little John with a very quiet effort, but a very successful one nonetheless. Jim Gambit started from pole, led a couple of laps, but just couldn't hang with those top two in the final section of the race, felt a seventh by the end of it. Blake Camphausen with the best run of his career as well by far, with an eighth place effort. I'm sure he might have been looking for more considering where he was at the start of the race, but uh, nonetheless, something to be proud of for him. Casey Lester, ninth place, solid effort by the 013 team. They were pretty strong all race long. Spencer Fullerton rounds out the top 10. Veteran road ringer, no surprise that he charged from the 28th starting spot to that position. And 11th place goes to Demir Bejenov, the hard charger of the race. He'll take over the points lead after going from 38th to 11th that race. The final verdict on the William Duncan Skyla Johnson incident is that William Duncan, the driver who is on probation for aggressive driving after Ulton Park, caused the incident with Skyla Johnson, had several opportunities to avoid said collision and avoid making said collision worse. He got in the throttle after making contact with the 29. And so William Duncan will be given last place for this event, and he will also be disqualified from competing in Cape Town. The team may hire a backup driver to fill in William Duncan's role at that race, but the car itself may only receive one quarter the points earned in Cape Town.